like I promised in my last episode of Chem in 3. This episode would be dedicated especially for students taking the IB Chemistry exam in May 2019 and it's happening in mere hours from today. It's Saturday night now and I hope that all of my students in class of 2019 are busy studying for the exams which are happening on Wednesday and Thursday. And these tips that I'm about to look at are taken from the recommendations of the IB examiners after they looked at the performance of students in the last November exam. And today, as promised, I look at three specific tips that apply to SL and HL students and three that are for HL only. Let's take a look first at the three SL tips. And the examiners pointed out that reaction quotient was an issue. And it didn't surprise me because I know that students often are quite familiar with the expression for Kc, the equilibrium constant. And they would quickly say that you put the product concentration divided by the concentrations of the reactants multiplied by each other, like this down here. If you put in the equilibrium concentrations into this expression, then you get the equilibrium constant. But what is this reaction quotient? It's where you take the reaction mixture at any point and you enter these parameters into the equation. The concentration of this divided by the concentration of this multiplied by this, as is given in this expression here. And if it is that Kc, the equilibrium constant, is 280, and when you solve, given these concentrations here for the mixture that's not at equilibrium, the fact that you get an answer of 20.8, which is far less than 280, what that shows is that the amount of product in relation to reactants is far less than what you would get in the equilibrium mixture. So it means that the reaction is very much still proceeding towards products or moving towards the right. Or you can say the mixture needs more product for the number to equal Kc. So these were the three specific points that were being sought to answer this question. Predict the direction of the reaction and showing your working. This, of course, is just a tiny extract from the November 2018 exam. Another point noted by the examiners was comparing the strength of the same type of intermolecular forces in different substances. And here the two substances were butanoic acid and ethylamine. And I have these two drawn here for you. And the first thing to note, and what most students would probably mention and only score one of the two marks, would be the fact that the hydrogen bond is stronger in butanoic acid, and not as strong in ethylamine, because here you have a hydrogen bond formed due to the presence of oxygen, which is more electronegative than nitrogen. And you should remember that only oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine can give rise to hydrogen bonding. So here, the fact that butanoic acid has an oxygen, which is more electronegative, gives it a stronger hydrogen bond. But the presence of this double bond O here is also going to give rise to polarity or a dipole. And this is going to be a very strong dipole, which is going to give rise to strong intermolecular forces. So butanoic acid is going to form stronger dipole to dipole interactions. And then also the fact that butanoic acid is a longer molecule than ethylamine means that it has the opportunity to form more London dispersion forces, which are the results of the movement of the electron cloud between carbon and hydrogen here that gives rise to small charges. And then a third and often neglected area of the syllabus for most students, the nature of science questions. But my advice to students is, if you see a question in the exam and you're quite familiar with the chemistry guide and you're wondering to yourself, where in the chemistry guide is this question from? Most likely, this question would be based on NOS, the nature of science. And this two-mark question proved difficult for most last November, where the examiners asked students to 
give one reason why the calculated value of delta H using Hess's law in part C of this question could be considered accurate, and then another reason why it could be considered approximate. And like is the case with nature of science questions, we had a range of possible answers that could give credit. But unfortunately, most students would look at it and be completely stumped or not know what to write. So it's important to take a note of all of these possible answers to this question. Now, moving to the HL questions. First one, calculating the mean oxidation number of an element in a species. Again, another simple question, but one that's not familiar to students because they've never seen the concept of oxidation number assessed in this way. Expect questions that are slightly different from what you've seen in the past. And here, one way to do this is to be aware that this neutral molecule would have an oxidation number of zero. The net oxidation number would be zero. And to bear in mind that oxygen would have a negative two, as it does in almost all cases, unless it's bonded to fluorine. So this would be a negative two for oxygen, another negative two here for oxygen. So that would be negative four. Hydrogen in all of these cases would have a positive one. The total of all the hydrogen oxidation states would be positive eight. So with hydrogen positive eight and oxygen negative four, it means that the contribution of the four carbons must also be negative four so that everything would sum up to zero. And with the four carbons giving you a negative four, then you just divide negative four by four and you get negative one as the average oxidation state of carbon and butanoic acid. There's another way to do it as well, where you can individually work out the oxidation state of each of these carbons. And that too would, when summed up and divided by four, give you an average of negative one. So watch out for questions like this in the exam. And while it might not be specifically on this, it might be on things that are designed in a way to assess the syllabus, but in a way that you've never seen before. Another question that proved difficult was from one of those little obscure areas of the syllabus. Predict giving your reasons whether manganese or iron is likely to have a more exothermic enthalpy of hydration. And the answer for this is simply to do with the size. Iron has a smaller size and therefore it has a higher charge density. The water molecules being held more closely to the iron atom. Remember, atomic size increases as you move from neon to lithium, or argon to sodium, or krypton to potassium. And finally, paramagnetism, diamagnetism, and differentiating between same electron spin orientation and unpaired electrons. State and explain the magnetic properties of iron-2 and iron-3 ions. This was the question posed last November, and students once again found it to be a difficult question. But both Fe2 and Fe3 ions are going to be paramagnetic, because in both cases, you still have unpaired d electrons. And it's simple. Paramagnetic compounds and atoms are attracted to magnetic fields and diamagnetic ones are repelled from magnetic fields. But to be paramagnetic, the more unpaired electrons that the species has, the better it would be. And in both iron-2 and in iron-3, you would have unpaired electrons. The same would go for cobalt and nickel, where you have lots of unpaired electrons. And these three elements are well known for their paramagnetism. And finally, I would like to leave you with a quick look at the entire report from the examiners in November 2018. For this is not something that is held confidentially by the IB, but it may not be accessible to all students. So here, you can take a quick look and pay attention to all of the points highlighted by the examiners as you get ready for this year's exam. If something was assessed in November 2018, chances are it will be assessed again in May 2019.